begin and go live. All right, welcome back. We are Game 2014. Uh, that's Mobile Game Development 1 at George Brown College in the fall of 2021 semester. And it's week three, part one of our broadcast. We'll break it up between uh, lecture lab like we've done in the past. Uh, one thing I am doing is recording live during this session, which is typically done in the second section. So let me just go up here and add a uh, YouTube uh, link for those people who need the support again. I think it's uh, it gives you kind of a real-time um, Closed captioning support and those kind of things and I think it's uh, well, that's a weird code um, It kind of uh, it's pretty good. Yeah, how did that work out? <laughs> Ooh, okay, that was weird. That's true. Yeah, that is a strange code and a half, right? Um, let's see what that is yeah, that is really strange. I've never seen a code like that. Um, yeah, so let me just go back to this again and try that out one more time. It's not awesome. We'll just use a web link instead. There we go. That should work for you. Uh, the web link stuff, I'm just hoping to make it like an actual embedded video. Sometimes it just doesn't work out with Blackboard. It is what it is. All right, so there it is. There's that um, the video for those people who need it. It's up on Blackboard. Um, so I think it's, um, again, it gives you more support. So where we are, we are at week three. And this week, I'm going to be talking about building mobile interfaces. We're going to start this week. The lab is actually due next week. Uh, so that is October 1st, uh, 2021 at midnight. So if you look at the schedule, you can see that we're heading into the 24th. And then next week, week four will be uh, when this thing is due. So lab... Um, Yes, yes. So, but um, it'll give you a chance. I've I've got it. Um, I've got it. I'm just extending the time frame uh, for the lab just to make sure that everyone has a chance to to get this done. It's the first time you're building things, and I want to give you a chance to um, you know to put something that's more interesting together than what we've done uh, in our last session. All right. So that's uh, what's happening in terms of schedule. Uh, week four, also, we have, like you said, uh, Vincent, uh, part one is due, which is all your assets. You should be working on that right now on your own. It is an individual assignment, like we've mentioned before, and um, that is up. And also, next week, you also have a test, a quick theory test around uh, mobile basics that will cover weeks one to three. Um, so lots of stuff going on on week four. It's kind of a, uh, almost like a mini midterm uh, that's happening. Um, so please be aware of that. I'll also release assignment uh, one part two, which is going to give be your logic piece, and um, that's going to kind of set you up nicely uh, for getting everything done for um, uh, as we roll into you know week seven. All right. So again, a couple of quizzes and so on, and then there's a practical test on week seven where you actually build something. Max asks. Uh, uh, how good our assets should be on our first assignment. Um, free assets look cheap. Yeah, you can find some free assets that look pretty bad. Absolutely. Uh, but there's also sometimes some assets that don't look so bad that you can find, especially if you go on the asset store, there's some stuff uh, that is free that's not bad. Um, yeah, uh, it is. I mean, for the most part, you are still making a prototype. So to me, Obviously, you want to make the assets look as best as you can if you're going to use this and take it forward. But I'm also reasonable in that this might just be a great little prototype and learning assignment for you um, as you um, as you kind of are picking up things about Unity uh, for myself and Joss, and then rolling into um, you know putting things together for your for your first assignment. So, do they have to look super awesome uh, to answer your question? No, it'd be nice if they would. Um, do you should you pay for them? No, I don't think you should. If you want to, you can. But um, uh, is it for placeholder assets? No, Raquel. I want you to make it the final asset because you have no time for the for placeholder and then replacement. Because the second part is going to be more challenging. You're going to do more logic. So whatever you've got, you've got. I recommend. All right. So in other words, like um, again, like I said before, in a real scenario, in a different scenario, we would have more time. Uh, to do a pivot if we didn't like the asset and all that kind of stuff. But for the most part, I think gather your assets, use those, make the logic, and you're good to go. And that's really the idea. 
Vincent says, I think A1's point is for assets, the ba basic game mechanics. Absolutely. Um, Raquel says, time to bust out the art, the art tablet. And Vince, uh, Vinit says, the part two will be for actual implementation. Yes, it will. It'll be a putting everything together uh, step as well and making everything work, all your assets work. Okay. Yeah, and it says, time to bust out the MS Paint. Yeah. <laughs> Well, whatever works for you. I mean, you know, don't make it too crazy. I'm not asking you to do, uh, you know, uh, insane stuff for, um, you know, for, for this project. It's just for you to learn how to do mobile games, what works for mobile games, and that kind of stuff. Okay. So that's, uh, you know, kind of the schedule. Let's move into what we're doing this week. So um, last week, we kind of had a bit of more an example on how to build for mobile uh, this week, um, we're going to be talking more of a design perspective. So again, we're into the design side, and um, we're going to talk about uh, maybe some stuff you've you've read before in the past. Um, so again, this isn't just a Unity course. This covers design. This covers um, uh, programming patterns. Um, this covers a bunch of little things to get you kind of rolling in the right direction, right? So um, so this is one of the design pieces. Uh, that we're going to be covering this uh, this week. And again, this is something that uh, Philip wanted, one of our other professors, when we were talking about the course, he's like, they really need to understand mobile design, not just not just uh, programming. All right, so again, one thing that I've talked about in other courses, and I'll talk about it in here, is that every game is a world, okay? And um, I like to also think about it, and again, and and I've talked about it in different ways before, as the game space. So you have the game space, the place that you're going to play, your environment, if you will. And what we want to do is we want to create an interface that will allow the player to, to connect uh, with the game world. Okay. And it's got to be good enough so that the player can move around the world and, um, you know, and, and, and do what they have to do for, and, and I've heard some, a game design ideas this morning, um, for example, as, or this afternoon, we're kind of early afternoon now, um, which is something like, well, I'm making a tower defense game. I really don't have a player necessarily that's separate uh, from the uh, interface. Um, you know, it, the player is the, is the, is the world in, in many ways. How does it work? Well, the interface is still super important for, uh, for any type of game. But the most important thing is to make the better the interface you make, um, you know, the more usable your game is, the better the experience the player is going to have um, is what we want to look at. So the idea here is um, we want to um, think about if you're developing this as, um, as an agile project and you're not, because again, you're just building up some, uh, some capability this semester, you're developing user stories and you start thinking about prototype game me mechanics and those kind of things. And, you know, kind of, create them into some kind of interface the players can um, uh, to use to kind of, you know, play your game. And one thing that you're, you're going to start looking at once you start putting your interface together is things like unforeseen complexity, which is mentioned here, where, you know, you start thinking about, okay, wait, I want to make this interface. I have a quest system. I have an inter uh, some kind of, um, and I'm, I'm, talking about this, I'm not expecting you to make this right now or anything like that, or I have some kind of inventory system, I have a drag and drop interface, how do I do that, right? And those kinds of thoughts, you, you're, you're, you're thinking, oh yeah, I mean, interface for a drag and drop um, inventory system, that's easy, right? And then you start building it and you realize, wow, it doesn't look great, you know? Um, how does it look on, on PC? It looks okay. Uh, when we when you build your first um, uh, prototype with WebGL, let's say as an example, it's fantastic. But as, once you build towards uh, uh, mobile, it looks like crap, or it doesn't work, or it's too big, or it's too small, or whatever. Right. So so there's some great um, you know ways of doing the same things. But the idea here is that once you start building your interface, you realize that there's stuff in the background that um, you know from a logic perspective that doesn't quite. It's not as easy as you thought. So what you want to make sure that, uh, and this is important, remember we talked about that players have limited time when it comes to mobile games. So any kind of touches, any kind of uh, interactions 
as an example, should be fun and uh, contextual. So there's got to be some reason why they need to interact with your game, right? So again, um, you're going to have some, you're going to provide the player some short-term and long-term goals, right? Again, you might have some short-term goals that are, that are really fun to play, kind of an immediate uh, perspective, and you should have some longer-term goals to retain the player and persuade them to return, replayability, and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, otherwise, it's just if it's just a pick-up-and-play game, it doesn't mean anything. You know, as an example, uh, you know, they may not come back if they've just tried it one time, if there's nothing else other than that one level that you've shown them. Um, so we're going to be talking about the idea of challenge versus skill and what's the difference between that. And we need to kind of balance those two kind of uh, aspects over time so that it's not too easy, it's not too hard. The idea is, and this is one key that we're going to be talking about today, is the game should always be easy to learn but hard to master. And I'm sure you've heard of that before over the time that you've been here at George Brown. Um, the other thing is we always want to give some kind of, of um, feedback to the player about how they're going, how they're doing. And whether it's like uh, health, you know, kind of um, health bars or progress bars or, you know, some kind of mini map or something like that that's showing how close are you to, to getting to your goal. Um, heck, even when I'm using my navigation in my car nowadays, there's depending on the na navigation you're using, the built-in nav shows me how close I am to the, to, you know, to the to the flag. It says, "Oh, you're almost there," you know, kind of stuff. It's different than Google Maps, um, and sometimes I switch between the two because um, you know I don't have internet in some places. But the thing is that um, the idea of of you progressing towards a goal, as an example, whatever the interface is, it's got to provide feedback to the player to give them a sense of how they're doing. Um, and it's going to make it super easy for them to understand if they're doing well or they're not doing so good. Okay. So one of the things is this idea of flow. Okay. And, um, you're in the game so much, you're doing something that, you know, you feel this joy and contentment in playing the game. You're doing really well, maybe in the game, or you're really enjoying yourself and you're being lost, uh, by, you know, kind of um, uh, playing in the game itself, you're fully immersed. That that feel of fully immersion, full immersion, is what um, uh, is what you're getting into. Sometimes it happens when you're playing a sport, um, you're working out. You know, as an example, when 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 it's not necessarily COVID, um, you're doing something that's that is physical. Um, sometimes raking the, the you know the leaves in your yard um, if you have a yard, or uh, or doing something like laundry. You know, you're getting into the feel of this. You've lost yourself, right? As an example, and um, you're not thinking about the now. You're just into the moment, you know, uh, kind of thing. And um, sometimes when you're playing sports, uh, or when you're playing a video game, or even when you're doing something like modeling, painting, some kind of artwork or whatever, you kind of get into this thing called the zone. And I think trying to get a player into the zone and being fully immersed in the game world is should be one of our goals when we're making a game, right? So, so this uh, Hungarian-born psychologist, um, Haley, and I'm not going to pronounce his last name, but it, it actually has it here, um, has pioneered a field called positive psychology, which tries to understand, um, you know, why we have experience like being in the zone. What is that idea? um you know of being in the zone how do we get to that how do we is it a is it a state of mind um as an example and this concept of flow right in that uh, you know what we we have um we have our perceived skills and the idea of perceived challenge and how they the flow state kind of balances that off like when we have a balance between those two things how we think we're doing and how we're, you know, how, how challenging we think the game is, perceived as different than actual, by the way, um, creates that, uh, can help us to get into the flow state. When we feel really skillful in something that we're doing, um, and it's challenging enough, so it's not like, I'm not pandering to your, you know, to your low level of, of ability, you know, as an example. It's just, you're doing well. You know, we've trained you, the game has trained you, you did really good. And you're doing it. You're you're actually you know doing the stuff that we've trained you to do, right? As an example, in the game, 
time can seem to blur. You know, you don't feel the state of uh, you've lost time. Something that might take 20 minutes feels like five minutes. Um, you know, um, as they say, time flies when you're having fun, right? So, and this state of mind, uh, like I said, is called flow, and it's something that we want to try and capture uh, with, um, with your activities, things that you present to the players. So, so flow, this thing explains why some experiences are enjoyable and, um, eight elements have been defined that go into the most enjoyable uh, um, experiences. And so let's talk about them really, really briefly here. We'll just outline them. I'm not going to go through and read all the slides. These are some for you when it comes for your quiz next week. So, so, People who experience flow believe that they can complete tasks. Okay, so that's one thing. They concentrate on the activity. So if they don't believe that they can complete the task, it's too difficult. They're not in flow state yet. Okay, if you make it so that the task is undoable or they seem disconnected, that is not a good thing. Um, they receive clearly communicated goals. They know what their goal is. They know what they're doing. Right, and immediate feedback when they're uh, when they're playing something. Right. So they're getting feedback that they're doing well. They're seeing that they're doing that. They're feeling it. They're concentrating on their goal. They're allowed to concentrate. Um, there's not distractors or detractors, obstacles for them to, to access the game world. None of that stuff. They are deeply involved in the task because they're invested in some way. Sometimes that investment is they've made a character at the beginning. They've made a character that molded the character as an example. And the act of molding the character makes them more deeply involved. And I go back when I talk about this in the other course that I'm doing, uh, when it comes to narrative design and character design, when I'm, when you think about making a character in Dungeons and Dragons, and again, I'm going to put my hand up and say, I play that game. Uh, some of you may have played it as well. And there might be similar, uh, you know, kind of uh, situations when you're making a character for a game, a video game, uh, whether it's in, a, a, you know, kind of some kind of RPG or open game world where you've, Molding your character, even if it's just the way they look, you know, you made it, you're making a character look a certain way. Uh, you're changing their their hair and their their eye color. Some people do go through all these details, and they might spend a lot of time in this little mini game, right? I'm putting it in air quotes here, a mini game that kind of gets you invested in the character, how they look, and all that stuff. That is a really a critical step, in my opinion, when you create your your player. Select your loadout for other kind of games. Let's say I, I have an option to have options, right? Uh, to make my game, my, my vehicle look a certain way. I can choose my color, uh, you know, or um, select my, um, you know, my player, Mario, Mario Kart. I think about like I can select, you know, kind of another player uh, with different animations and all that kind of stuff. I become more invested when I have choices. When I have, when players have agency, the ability for them to choose the ability for them to navigate the game world, they start becoming more invested, right? So, um, and this agency or sense of control, it's not really 100% control because it really does, it really basically, we've, we've limited them due to our programming. Our programming, when we start programming a game, as an example, there's limitations on what the player can do. But the more that they feel that they have uh, a lot of choices, the more agency that they feel they have, Right then, they this experience of more control gives them uh, a deeper involvement as well, and they need to be able to have this. We want to get them to the point where they lose this concern for the self necessarily. I know this is kind of weird, and they lose the sense of time. Again, time flies when you're having fun, and you're doing this because these are all the the parts of flow that we're describing, right? So. Um, we want to talk about perception a little bit. And um, a lot of times in business, and this is kind of something that we talk about in business, perception is reality. You may have heard that term, perception is reality. And, um, you know, if you think that your uh, boss hates you, well, then your boss hates you. That's the kind of idea. If you think that you're not, uh, you're not doing well, that no one likes you, then that's just, that's, that's, how, that's re your reality, right? And there can be a lot of reasons for that. So when someone says, you know, this is how I feel about something, we don't discount them. We shouldn't discount them because it's real. It's really real how they're feeling. Maybe it's not real for us. Maybe we don't see it the way that they see it, but it's real for them, right? So this idea of perception 
and sometimes it's also not just perception, but uh, also um, how we look at a player, as an example, um, you know, is is really important. All right. So again, it's perception compared to reality, right? So it doesn't matter what the real skill is of the player. If they feel they have their own idea that they're doing well, that's good, right? And um, it really doesn't matter about the game designer either. The game designer's role is to make a game that is challenging. But the idea here is um, that you want to make it so that they feel, uh, the player feels the game is challenging. It's not about what the designer feels, right? So, right. Vincent's got some. <laughs> um, so, so let's take a look at a bit of a graphic. And I love graphics because they kind of, again, I'm a, this is a visual medium. We can look at words all day long. But um, what we want to think about is different kinds of, ver of mental states that can be experienced based on your perceived skill and your challenge, right? So we can see here on the left, there's the challenge level from low to high. And the bottom, there's, you know, kind of the skill level from low to high. So think about this again. And this is something that they put together um, in different design books. You may have seen this same idea if you've, if you've done any kind of game design training not just about programming or art, but actual design and psychology a little bit. So if we have low challenge, so very low challenge, easy, and very low skill level, we just really don't care too much. A lot of this, again, example, I always think about this as like the cookie clicker game, you know, the idle games that you mentioned before, Yanov. Um, you know, those kind of games. That's, for me, it's, I don't care about those kind of games, whether I make it or not, and if I keep clicking on it, if I don't, who cares? You know, unless you're further in, <laughs> this is where it becomes really crazy. Um, you know, when even those kind of games, if you've played it for a long time and you've got lots of points and you stop, <laughs> that can be kind of removing you from flow too. Um, so, so this is kind of one way of looking at it. And as you go up the challenge level, even if you have a low skill, you can go from apathy to worry. You know, as an example, I don't have a lot of skill here. And my challenge is going up. Um, and if I'm not trained or I, I, it's too difficult, then I can get into this anxiety state, right? I think about a lot of times, uh, you know, things like Dark Souls. Dark Souls, for all, some people, they feel a lot of anxiety with something like Dark Souls or Demon Souls because the training is very minimal. And really, it's just about you learning, you know, after you've died a couple times. <laughs> but people don't like to die in games, right? Uh, people don't like their character dying in a movie either. You watch a movie and the character, main character dies off or has, you know, uh, really difficult times and doesn't re rebound or whatever. It's not the formula, the Hollywood formula that people are looking for, right? So, yeah, exactly. If you don't, if you, at first you don't succeed, die, die again. That might be something for, um, you know, for Demon Souls or Dark Souls. It can produce a lot of anxiety. Low skill, high challenge level. It can be challenging, right? The other way is also, uh, it can also be weird. I have low challenge level and I have a really high level of skill, right? Um, some people can feel bored if the challenge level is low for a long, long time. Some people just can relax, especially if you're, you know, um, a good example of that is if it's, you're playing it for casual, you're a casual gamer, you're not a hardcore uh, gamer who is, you know, after the tournament or anything like that. Um, so again, you know, maybe a more relaxing thing. But what we want to get to is where we have high challenge level and uh, our high skill and high challenge level. And as we move towards the right top right of the screen, you're going to see where, you know, if the challenge level is kind of medium and the skill level is high, then you feel a lot of control. Right. And as you get into high skill level and high challenge level, you can get from arousal, which means like your your um, stimulation, which is what arousal means into flow and that flow is where we want to get players and it's really challenging to get people in there right so um and the way to do that of course is to build them up and and add additional challenge levels as you go not all games do this right some games are flat and they have a flat experience curve as an example um and you know other games are more interactive and they want to continuously pose challenges to players um you know uh over the time they're playing the game so again not going to read all this this is for your for your reading but 
let's consider some other positive states that can exist in the upper right portion of the figure. We talked about this flow, the ideal state of mind for a game. The player's skill and challenge are in a perfect balance, right? Now, think about that word perfect. It's perceived, right? Um, leading to this deep engagement and satisfaction. Um, you know, normally no game can achieve this kind of thing. Um, you know, but we want to get things. We move around. It's not always, you're not always in a sense of flow, especially you're moving from one level to the other. You're seeing a cutscene or something. It can do that. And there's different states that I've kind of mapped out here for you uh, for your reading pleasure. We kind of talked about them already. Um, so let's um, talk about the sources of challenge. So where do you get challenge from? Because you want to be able to challenge someone, a player that's playing your game. So again, really cool to have periods of relaxation in a game. Um, and sometimes there's uh, we want to you know show them something. We want to have them access, uh, you know, a quiet area where they can uh, adjust their inventory uh, or their loadout. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're playing a tank game, a, a role-playing game, an open world game, you know, whatever. Uh, that period of relaxation where they kind of come down from 100% concentrating on, um, on the thing that they're doing, the fight, as we like to call it, or the conflict, right? Um, we want to present good challenges to the player. And really, if you think about this, the best games are about learning, right? So we start them off and we want to, you know, train them, train the player on how to really be good in our game, whatever that is, right? So um, we can introduce new challenges and that comes in the form of interactions, uh, you know, presenting them with tactics and strategies, things that they need to do to, you know, it's not going to be a straight kill as much anymore. There's more than um then one way of of approaching the problem uh, as an example complexity so there's many stages to try and to get uh, to try and get them to fix that to finish that quest whatever that quest is um and as well as physical skills like in other in other words things like reaction time um the the, the ability for you to move from one set of maneuvers to another set of maneuvers you know very quickly that takes time and you want to build capability with um you know your interface for the player all right, so that's kind of where we want to go. How do we disrupt flow? Um, if we make the game too challenging, if there is a sudden huge leap in challenge, so everything is great, great, great. Actually, I remember playing Dark Souls again. I think about Dark Souls. You know, you're killing these guys. They show you how to do it. Then you face the first boss, and you're like, holy crap, right? You know, it's like really crazy challenging that first boss in Dark Souls 3 I'm talking about now. And um, but later on, you realize it's not that bad, but you don't understand, um, you know, how to fight a boss like that because there's certain tactics they've, they, you know, from software. What they've done is they've really made it so that there is um, the AI is smart enough to detect you, but yet it's predictable. And there's a pattern to how the boss fights. You don't get that in the beginning. And I'll tell you, for most people that I've seen uh, play Dark Souls 3 in the first boss, they die. Right. It just happens. And they get really frustrated because like, holy crap, that was really hard. I built up. I didn't die the entire time. I was really, really careful. But as soon as I got to the boss and I stepped through that mist, I'm dead. Right. Um, really huge decreases in challenge. So you've built up challenge for a long, long time and you've built up capability. And also now it's like super easy. Right. That's also it'll take them out of flow. Um, and also. This is really key. Changing the fundamental nature, your mechanic of what makes the game fun. You move them from one type of game, almost like another, there's almost like a game within a game. And they've learned how to play the game in a certain way. They've really enjoyed it. You've trained them how to do it. And now you're getting to do a whole new set of skills. It's like a different game that you're getting them to play. Um, and some of that happens when it play, sometimes students will come to me and say, okay, I want to make this game where you're playing a, you know, bullet hell shooter and then. I, the second level, you're not a bullet hell shooter anymore. So all the training that I've given you, you're not doing that anymore. Now you're an endless runner. And at the end of that level, well, now you're going to get into a platformer. Guys, don't do that kind of stuff. That is, like, not cool. And they, they have this context where I'm in space and then I land on the planet and from there I go into the puzzle. You know, unless you can transfer the skills from one thing to the other, um, you know, it, it's very challenging. Sometimes it happens in games like Destiny, right? Where you're running around in Destiny, and I'm talking about a third in a first person perspective or a third person perspective, and you're blowing stuff up, 
And then now you're asked to get into a vehicle and you have to do really well with that vehicle. Now, the vehicles in some of these games are much easier to get into because it's a brand new skill. Navigating with the vehicle, making sure it works. It's something that you haven't been trained to do for a while. And suddenly that mission wants you to, requires you to go into the vehicle. And if you don't do the vehicle thing, you won't be able to finish the mission because it's too tough. You know, there's something to do. It's part of the puzzle, if you will, of the mission. And that changing fundamental nature of the game where you're moving from one type of thing to the other, different set of controls, all that kind of stuff can take you out of flow. It'll disrupt flow. And you've got to be really careful to, to you know, kind of transition a player into that kind of um, thing and provide another set of tutorials for them. Give them a chance to understand how to do that. So again, um, we want to think about the interface as the doorway uh, to your game world. The interface is super important. And the interface is the, uh, is the thing we can focus on. And we're going to focus on that uh, this week and a bit of next week as we build uh, responsive design for mobile. Let's think about this idea of magic uh, game interfaces, which is interesting. So Arthur C. Clarke, um, you know, he talked about this. He's a, one of my favorite uh, writers as well back in the day. He said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I love that line. I don't, I'm sure you've heard something like that before. Uh, you know, high technologies like magic. And it makes sense, right? So, um, and so too, when we think about user interface design. You know, we want to make it so that uh, the interface hides the complexity and makes it easy for the player to learn what to do. Um, and if an interface is really awesome and makes sense, it's balanced, um, it could be minimalist, right? So only what the, the player needs doesn't detract from the game. It's not going to distract them or become an obstacle for them to play the game, but actually it's going to help them. They need it. And it's, uh, it's maybe even customizable right? This kind of thing. Um, then the user doesn't even realize that, that it exists. It's part of the game. It's just, you know, part of the flow, if you will. So this is what part of the magic is, all right? So let's think about um, uh, five elements that we can use to design a game interface, right? So memories, so making a lasting impression on the player. So when you think about, they, they see the interface and then they remember, they recall, uh, you know, what, uh, how the, they're going to be able to use this thing. Um, it allows them to, to, uh, to uh, focus their attention and provides them a place to, to, uh, to look in terms of getting feedback, right? Um, communicates things like goals. So if you have like a, a quest system, it's gonna, the interface will provide some information uh, to the player, feedback and progression as an example, intuition. So it's gonna make it so that the, you know, uh, the player is going to see the interface react in the exact same way he or she feels it's going to react. And of course, we want to give the player a sense of agency and control, right? Because the more control we give the player with the interface, the more immersed they're going to be in our game world. Okay. So again, I'm not going to read through all this stuff. This is more kind of deeper information for you if you're interested in understanding um, more stuff. But think about this in terms of um, if I had to relearn my interface every single time, right? So if my interface was so different, and, and I mean that in terms of even my controls were so different that uh, I didn't realize that, you know, the, if I was going to use a gamepad, you know, the Y button is, is maybe a jump in some games, but sometimes it's the A button, depending on what it is, right? And I don't, I can't remember if it's the A button or even the, you know, the bumper, uh, the right bumper on my, on my uh, uh, gamepad, the default control scheme, whatever I have. And if I get to, you know, kind of relearn my user interface or my control scheme, um, it can really be, you know, can take me out of uh, flow again. Um, so what we want to try and do here is um, we want to use imagery in order for us to, and, and the interface has to also be contextual. So I don't want it, so like I make an, an, an interface that doesn't make any sense with the game. It looks like sci-fi, but I'm playing a you know fantasy game or something like that. Um, you wanna make it so that the interface matches your aesthetic as well, okay? Again, so it encourages, um, you, know, uh, you know, the strengthening of memories, um, you know, which is important. So they understand how to use it. And, um, 
The other thing is that you should be able to have the same mechanic. There's almost like a mechanic for your interface. If I have some kind of switch or dial uh, type of interface or sliders, then sliders and dials and switches should be all over the interface, um, you know, as much as possible. Once I learn to interact with the interface, it should be the same interaction in other parts of, of the game. Uh, so, you know, if I have to flip and there's a bit of an animation, I'm training my player that every time they uh, flip a switch, on the interface, whether it's 2D or 3D, there is an animation that happens that, and maybe even some sound, um, you know, that basically shows them that there or makes them feel like something's happened. And we take that away, right? Then again, it breaks the, uh, the interface, the immersion that we're going to give them. Vincent says, it reminds me when I play Ghost Runner on console, its control scheme is so different from other FPSs. And it's true. You know, you want to kind of give um, some standard or default, you know, uh, a lot of companies create a default scheme and then they allow you to remap your keys um, if you like to make a scheme that works for you. And I always think about games like, um, you know, Doom Eternal for that, right? So Doom Eternal's default, um, you know, control scheme, you know, is okay, but it allows you to customize that, uh, customize that thing so you can really have, like, your controls could be like smooth as butter. Right. It's amazing what you can do with it if you customize your interface or your controls. And customization is 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 uh is truly important. We'll talk about that later. Um so, so think about these questions um that you can make your interface more memorable. So do my tutorials and explorations promote exploration and experimentation? That's kind of important. Can I introduce new parts of the interface at periods of emotional engagement? So example, maybe there's some kind of things that the player can do um, as an example that you're giving them access to do as they progress in the game. And so they can't do everything. Example, maybe their character or your the main character in the story can fly at some point, but they don't learn how to fly at the beginning. They learn how to fly later. So the whole fly control things and the part of the interface is inaccessible until, you know, they unlock it, uh, you know, later on. And it could be emotional, especially if, they're gifted that ability by someone in the game, uh, as an example. Um, so think about these questions. How can I heighten the emotional connection to interface components by using powerful, stimulating imagery? How can I do that? And um, how do I reward the player for learning parts of the interface? So I learned something. There should be some kind of reward around it as well. And where can I reduce text as much as possible? Reduce text and replace it with visual content. Because at the end of the day, right, the more text there is, the slower it's going to be. If I see an image and we're a very, you know, kind of uh, visual, uh, you know, most gamers are visual. They look at something and they're like, okay, I understand what that, that image is. You know, can I reduce text and replace it with the visual content to, to improve uh, responsiveness? And am I consistent, which is what I was saying before, in the ways that I repeat user interface elements? It's really super important. And Vincent says, like how in old school Mega Man, where you get a new weapon every time you beat a challenging boss. Yeah, exactly. And they can drastically change how you approach different levels. Sometimes, though, you know, I find that, um, you know, uh, you're given the option to replace certain powers or abilities with new powers and abilities. And some people just keep the old ones because they've been training and using them for so long. So also be cogniz cognizant of that when you're designing your uh, your interfaces for players. Attention. Um, really bi-directional, right? So on one hand, I want to get your attention with something in the interface. On the other on the other hand, I want them not to be distracted. I want them, the players to be to have their attention focus on the interface itself, as an example. Um, and you know, one thing that it says here, which is key again, is remember it's perception, right? Which is um, give them the idea that they're the center of the game universe, like they're the hero of the story or the heroine. Uh, as an example, um, we want to ask the players to uh, make decisions. Of course, that we do, and um, we we want them to make it active. If it's something that's passive or that happens by itself over time, you know the player's attention to the game and their interests will go down. Right. So again, if there's a constant flow of information, I keep you focused. But if it's too much then the player can get overwhelmed. So you have to kind of balance the amount of information we're, we're providing in the interface with the player uh, so that it's exactly what they're looking for and customizable again, going back to that customizable idea with what they're looking at. Um, 
uh, I really think another thing is looking good. And this is a looking good thing. Um, you know, if I see an interface that looks really appealing to me, I'm going to look at it longer. If it's an ugly interface, I want to shove it away. I don't want to look at that thing if it's terrible, right? Um, and so, you know, uh, game companies have spent a lot of money and a lot of time making diegetic interfaces, interface, interfaces that look like um, what the player would see, as an example, and making it, again, part of the game world. So a good example of a diegetic interface is the Pip-Boy, right, in Fallout, uh, the Fallout series. So Fallout 4, you know, and even in Fallout VR, where, you know, you're actually going to turn your wrist in Fallout VR to see your Pip-Boy, um, um, and the Pip Boy looks like what it, what the cutscene shows you in the game, where you get this device that goes on your wrist, and the Pip Boy is just a way for you to access things like your stats, your interface, your inventory, all that stuff. But it's a it's a thing. It's it's a mechanic that they put into play. So you have to pull up your Pip Boy and all that kind of stuff, and it gives you notes, it gives you um, the, your quest items, all the stuff, and they've tried to make it as diegetic as possible, right? So um, so. A diegetic interface that looks aesthetically pleasing and is contextual with the game world is kind of where you want to go, right? If you're not going to go diegetic, then the other option is go minimalist. So only pull up the interface when you need it, right? And don't pull up the interface when it's, don't put, you know, don't take up space, valuable real estate, screen real estate uh, in the game when the interface is not needed. Um, yep. Tam says most VR games use hands for, uh, the heads up display nowadays. Um, well, it's, it, the HUD on the screen isn't just jarring. It's also, it's difficult to resolve. Some players, depending on their, uh, on their headset, as an example, the, uh, resolution of words and the brightness of objects in world space, uh, can be, um, you know, can, you know, can make them feel sick and so on. Uh, and not just jarring, but also, um, you know, really uh, not usable, right? So another comment I have is uh, Skyrim VR couldn't play for more than an hour before I got sick to the number of, due to a number of stuff. Um, <laughs> Rick and Morty VR. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, and, uh, and, and but you got to think about those things. So games like Skyrim VR, which isn't bad, they have a nice little training area there as well. But I think uh, Fallout VR might be even worse. Because um, remember that the game Fallout was never made with VR in mind first. VR was added after, right? So whenever a game has VR, a VR mode that's, that's enabled later on and sold and packaged as a new game, um, there's a danger that it's just going to capture some of the elements of, of, uh, of the scene. But the interactions is what you're missing. The way you're interacting, the interface is going to completely change, right? And sometimes, um, it, you know, a lot of times I, f I find that those things, because it's not made from the bottom up as a VR game, it fails and it makes you sick and it, and, and it's not the same and all that kind of stuff. It's not, a, not as exciting. For example, I've played uh, um, Fallout for days, right? And then when I try to play it in VR, I'm like, okay, I got to take this off now. And it's not because of the comfort of my headset or the ability for me to take VR. It's because some interactions are really weird, right? So, and it's not made uh, the same way as you would make it in VR. Um, so one thing, again, what we want to do is when it comes to attention is the idea is I want to capture and deliver attention. And there's some questions we can ask ourselves. For example, what do I do in the game to make the player feel like this, like they they are the center of attention. How do I do that? You know, um, how can I use beauty or aesthetics uh, in my interface to grab the player's attention? Because an ugly interface is going to not want them to be around, not not want to look at the interface. Um, you know, what do I do that is new and differentiated? So maybe something that's interesting that doesn't obstruct the interface, you know, with the unfamiliar, but yet makes it interesting for them to look at, right? And the other one I like to think about is when it comes to attention is what about when I want to focus on the game world, right? And I don't want the interface to interfere. Can I shut it away? Can I put it away? Can I only show the health level of a boss when I'm fighting the boss? Um, can I only see the, you know, the, um, the health bars of, of, of enemies when I'm facing the enemy, but not when they're wandering around? And maybe a health bar is even the wrong thing. Maybe the enemy is going to have a diegetic, um, you know, kind of health status where I can see them bleeding or uh, they're, they have a different set of animations 
or something else that's showing me that that uh, they're, they've been hurt, um, so I can you know maybe uh, pick off the low hanging fruit as we as we like to say. Um, goals. So again, um, and this is kind of these these pieces are important. I'm kind of touching on the highlights here, and I'm not reading everything, but um, I want to be able to you know kind of create goals for um, or a set of goals as an example for every level that the player is um you know is playing if there's no goal and if it's an open world or whatever that can work for a while but you know providing some kind of quest system uh or goals uh and tying them into the interface somehow is again it keeps the the players going it keeps the players um you know uh engaged as much as possible um, so again, there's different kinds of goals. We can have immediate goals. So go, I want to, you know, here's one. I want to get the hell away from that goblin, right? Or longer term, I want to reach level 85 so that I can kick the crap out of these goblins, you know, as an example. Um, immediate goals are visceral, right? So there's something that's right in front of the player so they I can act quickly if I'm a player and, and defeat or, you know, kind of complete the goal. Uh, longer term goals, you know, uh, if they're really important enough, um, they might be part of a consistent or a persistent part of your, your screen real estate. For example, it might be part of a quest system where it says, you know, um, your time is running out. You know, maybe that's one of your goals. You have a time limit for when you have to finish the, uh, uh, the you know, the this particular level or that particular goal or quest. Sometimes quests are can be failed, right, if you don't uh, do it on time. I remember playing Red Dead Redemption, and if you uh, if you go off the track, when you're kind of, you know, using your horse to navigate, uh, you know, part of a path, you go off the path or whatever, and they'll tell you that this, this system, the game itself will tell you, get back on the path. You're off the path. Hey, what are you doing over there? You know, kind of thing. And the game is basically telling you that you're failing. And if you don't do it fast enough, if you don't go around the path fast enough, or if you don't round up, a, you know, a, a creature or do something that they want you to do, uh, shoot X number of targets with your gun whatever, you can fail. And, um, you know, you might have a longer term goal. Longer term goal might be something that you want to finish that keeps kind of a checklist of things that you want to, uh, you want to complete. Um, we've seen that, that kind of thing in um, Borderlands, you know, as an example, we have, you know, a quest system that pops up that basically says, hey, this is what you have to do. Check mark, you've done this uh, kind of thing. We've seen it in other games as well. And that, is something that stays on our screen for a longer period of time. It doesn't go away. So it reminds the player, um, you know, the, that the quest they're doing is still has these things that are left to complete. Okay. Um, so what we want to do is we want to be able to provide information for the player. But again, important thing to do is um, we want to provide the right information. We don't want to uh, make information so that's information overload, like we talked about earlier, because, you know, um, if we have provide too much information and or if it's taking up too much real estate on the screen, again, it can kick a player out of uh, immersion. So again, when we think about making your interface goal-centered, so the interface should be involved with the goal that they're making, and some kind of quest system should be part of almost any game that you play these days, even if it's like a top-down hell, you know, kind of a bullet hell shooter, you know, you've you're level one, you know, you, you defeat the enemies, even if it, the, if the, uh, the goals in your interface fade away, you know, as, as an example, uh, or if you want the player to focus on something that they're not doing, you've told them that they need to pick up a bomb in order for them to, um, you know, defeat the boss and they're not doing it, make it more insistent, change the colors, make the screen shake, tell them something is wrong, um, you know, so that they, they have to do this thing, um, in order for them to progress. Again, in some sense, that idea takes away from player agency, which we're going to talk about in a second. And the more you do that, the more people feel that the game is on rails, that they're 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 kind of going for a ride as opposed to interacting with the game. And that's also can be very bad. But ask these questions when it comes to making a goal center interface. Do I give the player enough information to make take to take actions uh, that further their goals? Okay. Do I expose the right mix of short, mid, and long term goals in my quest system? Can I see that? And, um, you know, what's the most important uh, reason the players are, are playing my game and how can I make, give them a, you know, a sense of the, a clear way to advance toward their goal? Do I have a mini map? 
do I have, uh, you know, pointers or some kind of, um, um, you know, directions, a compass, something that tells them where to go, where the enemies are, all that kind of stuff is important. Um, the more information you give a player in terms of how they can, you can, you're going to help them uh, achieve their goal, the better the interface is. Um, intuition. So again, you want to make the your interface uh, familiar, right? You don't want to make it so that it's something that doesn't make any sense. You know that you have um, every corner of your screen has some kind of thing. Remember that the player has a very limited attention, and it doesn't matter whether you're playing a mobile game or a PC game or what have you. They, you know, you don't want to take them away from the center of action. So a lot of times you notice that there's a lot of interfaces where all the controls are at the bottom of the screen, right? So think about this, right? Uh, how often do you see controls at the top corners of the screen? Not often, right? Why? Because it's more difficult for the player to look up than for them to look down, right? Looking down is much easier for for and the average player. So that's why a lot of the stuff is cluttered or 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 kind of spread out. Uh, the bottom portion of the screen, not necessarily the top portion of the screen. Um, and when it comes to, um, you know, uh, input, a lot of uh, input is almost exactly the same, right? We have the same kind of keyboard. We have a QWERTY type keyboard. That's what they're called, um, you know, as an example. And it was made, they've been, they've been derived, keyboards, you know, uh, new keyboards today have been derived from the Remington that was made for typewriters and 1873 so it's something that we've kind of inherited all that long time ago and even in VR if you use a keyboard a virtual keyboard in VR it looks exact same right because they want you to give you the same feel it's kind of something that's evolved over time by the way input in VR is one of the things that I'm I'm focusing my masters on and I can tell you that using some kind of virtual keyboard in VR really sucks it's terrible right typically uh, and a lot of that is because we don't get good haptic feedback, and we're not able to use all of our fingers when we're when we're accessing the, the keyboard. We're actually poking at it with one finger at a time a lot of times, or we're using some kind of drumsticks, uh, or as an example, or lasers to kind of select items on the keyboard in VR, which really sucks. And we got to figure out a better way of doing things. Yeah. So, um, but keyboards exist there too. So we want to make. Um, you know, the interface intuitive. We don't want to make it so different that they've never seen it. If I'm making a, an interface for uh, an MMO, I want to kind of look at other MMO interfaces. What have they done? You know, if I'm making an interface for a mobile game, what does the mobile interface look like uh, for the type of game that I'm making? Do I, can I, ex you know, kind of get examples of other people's stuff? What have they done? Are people used to that interface? And if I present something different, what are the advantages? What am I doing? Because again, we have this, you know, mental model uh, of how things should work. And if I break that mental model, right, for a player, um, it could dissuade them from playing my game just from that, just from the interface. Oh, I really don't like how it works. And there's no way of, of, uh, of changing my input uh, scheme. Uh, as an example, players might complain. They might say, well, you know, I have to play in a certain way, you know, um, as an example. And, and here's a good one. Um, some people like to play inverted. Right. Some people like to play inverted. There are people out there still, um, you know, that uh, when they play a uh, first person shooter game, they turn the Y, you know, your your vertical uh, axis inverted. Right. So you pull back almost like they're they're uh, they're flying a plane. Right. They pull back on the on the um, on your uh, uh, your game controllers. Right. The sticks on your game can pull back to look up and all those kind of things, which is a lot different. Right. So. Um, but some people like to play that way. And again, giving a player agency, the ability for them to change around the controls and make their uh, control scheme um, intuitive for them, I think is, uh, is really super important. So um, there's going to be some parts of your interface that's going to be new because it's related to your game. So if it's something that, that is not common, then give people tool tips, help text, uh, some kind of way of getting an idea of how to play that. The ability for you to go to another screen to show all the controls on a gamepad or on a touch screen and how all that stuff works so that they, or and the ability for them to swap those keys out. And we'll talk about the command pattern uh, maybe later this semester and how we can swap out the, the you know, your keys by, um, you know, by making them point, uh, you know, to a different set of controls instead of hard coding them. We don't want to, we try, we want to try and avoid hard coding interfaces altogether as much as possible. 
So let me ask some questions again. When it comes to making an intuitive uh, interface, you know, where have I gotten carried away with making things cool at the expense of making things familiar? So if it looks awesome, but it doesn't work, <laughs> right? That does, that's not good. Um, can I find objects from the real world that would be really familiar and, you know, to, to, for players and use them in the way, uh, you know, that they, that we think that they're going to be used. So again, one of that is transferring knowledge, right? So, uh, going back to VR, one thing to always think about is in, if you're making a VR game or something that is, that you can actually touch with your hands, if you see an item in VR, um, that we normally can, can, uh, do something with in the real world and you put it in VR, the player's going to try and touch it. Example, in a, if you go into an office in VR, and I don't know if anyone has experienced this, and there's some parts of the office that you can't open. You see a cabinet, and it's locked, okay? Then the, the cabinet should make a, a locking sound when you try and put it, like a click, click, click. So it's just not, it's locked, right? Um, you know, or if, um, you know, you see a mouse on a, on a desk, you should be able to move the mouse with your hand, right, in VR, because you're giving the, the you know, the, uh, that's the interface for the user. The, the interface in VR is the world, right? And the same thing goes with an interface in, um, you know, uh, on a 2D screen, uh, whether it's a handheld mobile device or on a PC. If you give the person something that they're familiar with in the real world and it's on their interface, they should know how to use it. And trying to build, uh, bring in things from the real world into the interface is a good idea because then it's now it's recall. I've seen that in real life. I've got some icons and symbols that I've seen. They're, you know, it's not they're they're not new icons and symbols, and I'm bringing them in so that they can uh, it can help, right? Control and again, I think the sense of agency here, this line here, a sense of agency is super important. I, I want to give a player a sense of control, right? They're, I don't want them to feel passive, you know, or hopeless. I want them to be active. And I want them to be able to, um, you know, to perform any action uh, that they can possibly dream of in the real kind of like in, in, a, in an ideal state. Right. So imagine if you're a player and this is something that I talked about before. I'm playing a game, playing Dungeons and Dragons. And, um, you know, as an example, as a tabletop player and uh, I have my dungeon master and they say, hey, here's a big castle. And on top of the castle, you see a dragon. Right. Like I, I've said this before uh, in the past. As a player, if I'm if I have the ability to climb, then if I want to kill myself, I should be able to go up to the, to the dragon and let him breathe on breathe on me, even if I'm first level, right? Agency, give the player the ability to hang themselves if they want to, right? Um, you know, if they want to fall off a cliff, you know, and if they want to jump down, don't prevent them. Don't say you can't go that way. Get them to fall off a cliff and die, right? If they want to, they did it. Give them a chance to do whatever they have to do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, hey, we're not saying that we're talking about suicide, uh, not, you know, at all. But what I'm saying is give them control or at least give them a sense of control. Give them the ability for them to explore the world they want. If you make a lot of buildings in a, in a game world, um, as an example, and this just goes back to the interface, and the buildings in the game world are inaccessible. You go, you know, you play a game like Fallout. I'm going back to that. Or even um, Skyrim. And you go to a hut or some kind of a building and it looks really nice. The texture is beautiful. But when you go to the door, there's no access. You can't break it down. Even though you're super powerful, you can't blow it up. Even though you've got crazy bombs, you can't do anything with it. It's literally just an obstacle. And really what you're playing then is a big landscape uh, that's, a, that's really a desert. That's all it is. You're playing in a desert. And there's only a couple buildings that you can go to, right? Because... That's all you've programmed to do, right? And the more you do that, the more you prevent uh, players from doing what they want to do, right? Really cuts back on people's enjoyment and removes the sense of immersion and flow, okay? So again, what you want to be able to do is give them as many, possi many possibilities as, as, as you can, but that requires a higher level of programming and it increases the number of options they have as a player and increase the amount of, of scenarios, uh, different kinds of scenarios for you as, uh, as a developer, because you have to start thinking about, okay, so if I give them the ability to, to fall off the cliff here, how does the player respond, all right, as an example? If I give them a, the ability to climb this mountain over here, you know, Skyrim doesn't allow you to climb mountains beyond a certain point, 
you know, is that going to ruin my my story later on, right? Um, do I have to, am I forcing a player, right, as an example, to do the main quest all the time? Do I have to force the player? And if I do, um, is that what I want? Is that, do I have to force them to play the, the, the story? And if they don't play the story, then the game's over. A lot of times those kind of things are a negative choice. It's not a good choice to do those kind of things. So too, when it comes to actions on the interface, if you make uh, elements on the interface that are uh, inaccessible, locked, uh, all that kind of stuff, you show elements of the interface to the, to the player that are locked, the player's gonna try and press those elements or, or, or click those elements anyway and hoping that they're gonna be unlocked. And so the idea is don't show something to the player, uh, and uh, you know, some kind of element that they don't have access to unless they know it's going to be something like that's going to cycle in into play. There's some kind of timer or a cooldown that's going to allow them to have that ability or power again. That's okay. But if it's something that's permanently locked on the interface that they're going to they're going to get this power or ability on level 20 and they're only level one, don't show them that. It's it's frustrating, right? Because they feel that they don't have any control. They feel that they don't have access to that. And they're curious about what they have that, how that is on their interface, right? So um, they don't want to think about the action to perform. They just want to do it, okay? And you want to make sure that the interface allows them to do that. So whenever you they do something right, you can provide them with a reward, right? And when they're learning a skill, um, you know, they, it can be as simple as, you know, when they press the right the, the right thing, you're going to use uh, sounds and images and animations to show them that things are going well. And if they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing um, because they're doing the wrong sequence of, of button presses, you can give them uh, sounds and images that tell them something's not right, right, as an example. So, you know, provide feedback at every corner as much as possible. Again, some questions you ask when it comes to, um, you know, giving a player agency and control when they're using your interface are, do I provide some kind of reaction for every action they take? So if I press a button, do I hear sound? Um, do, I, do I see an animation? Um, do I make it safe for the players to probe around in the interface and see what actions are possible in their current scenario? So in other words, like if they're at a certain level, they should be able to do any actions on the interface they want. You know, as an example, and when we say safe, again, going back to Dark Souls, sometimes we are learning the interface in Dark Souls and we just picked up a, a you know, something that, um, you know, that is going to save our life later on in the level. We did it earlier on. We've wasted that item. Like, for example, some kind of bomb, uh, as an example, they're gone, right? The bombs are all gone and we don't know. We didn't realize we were using those bombs, but we need them to defeat the boss and they're gone and we can never get them back. We got to start over. Right, that is not a safe way for players to explore the interface. Right, um, and are there any areas that I can cut the number of steps required to important, kind of to you know uh, uh, to perform important actions? So there's something important they have to do. They should be able to do it very quickly. Get uh, down to the uh, um, you know to the to the to business. Let's say with as few clicks as possible, a few presses as possible. All right, so that is the magic game interface idea. It's a mnemonic for us to understand, um, you know, how to create better interfaces. And this is not just for mobile games, but all types of games, whether it's uh, VR or whatever. Right now, what I want you guys to look at is I've got a play heuristics worksheet I want to talk about a little bit. And I put that up on uh, Blackboard. So if you look at Blackboard, there is a play heuristics document that you can download uh, and use. And I want to talk about play heuristics a little bit because um, it's interesting, um, you know, what, uh, what they do. They, they start making us think about, um, about how to build good interfaces and make good games, right? So first of all, what is a heuristic? We've talked about that when we talked about AI a little bit. It's a method, a methodology, or an algorithm um, that allows to do certain things. And play heuristics are kind of a way of uh, perceiving the world and um, creating, um, uh, Yenif says, Tom said, quick in regards to Plar, any new info and would um, game jams qualify? Uh, no, <laughs> no, not really. We'll talk about it after. If you really want to Plar uh, for certain courses, it's all down to uh, your experience and what you've built. And if you, if the outcomes of the course are, have been, um, uh, yeah, I know, Pedgeman, eh? Uh, this is where it comes from. 
Um, so actually, Play Hero 6 are really awesome, uh, Vincent. So uh, there's nothing wrong with showing something like this. And this is an, just an example. Um, but yeah, uh, going back to Yanov's question, I think the important thing about um, um, about uh, you know doing a PLAR is you get assessed in terms of uh, do you know can you meet the outcomes of the course and at what at the at the right level. Okay, let's go back to this. Um, so yeah, this this is not mine. This is comes comes from a researcher that I know either at another institution, and they talk about games user research all the time. This is kind of a we've have kind of lifted it from the whole games user research uh, course. And brought it here because I found that when I was doing games user research, one of the things that they talked about, this happened way later, and it would have been really nice to know, uh, you know, a lot about this way earlier, right? So when you're designing your interface for mobile um, and, again, for uh, for your games, think about some of these things. So, um, and I'm going to talk about sections. These are almost like categories uh, of play. So, and you have the document as well. So when you look at a heuristic, Let's say, for example, uh, the heuristic is enduring play, right, for your game. So there's different parts that may or may not apply to the game that you're making right now. So, for example, A1, so heuristic, enduring play, 1. The players finds the game fun with no repetitive or boring tasks. It's almost like a, uh, a questionnaire that you, can, that you can do. If you look at a questionnaire like this and you say, check mark, I see that the game would find the game, the players fans, you know, play the game is not repetitive or boring tasks, which kind of links right into what we talked about before in terms of challenge versus skill. Makes sense, right? Players should not experience uh, being penalized repetitively for the same failure. So if I've, if I've done something wrong, you know, don't keep uh, making me lose health or, you know, tell me that something is wrong, uh, but to a point, right? If I keep getting penalized for, for doing the wrong thing, um, it makes me feel, uh, you know, oppressed and I don't want that. I want to, I don't really want to feel stressed or worried when I'm playing a game. I want to feel excited and I want to feel at the center of the game. Um, the player should not lose any hard won possessions. Oh my God. How many times has, uh, times has this heuristic been uh, violated, if you will, uh, when we're playing certain games, Minecraft is a good example. You go and you die from a mob in Minecraft, unless you turn on, don't lose my possessions. Uh, as an option, right? Um, you know, you've lost everything and you got to start over, right? Or again, I'm going back to Dark Souls again. You've collected a bunch of souls and you've gone through the game and you die. And now you got to go back and you've lost everything. It's a terrible feeling to lost to lose everything. So I think this is a heuristic that should be paid attention to more often by players. Um, sometimes what happens is uh, designers might take away uh, the ability for you to keep hard won possessions to increase uh, replayability. Want they want you to go and do it again, or maybe they you haven't proven that you know that skill. You just don't know, um, you know how to do that thing. Whatever they've asked you to do, and they want you to go retrain, give you another opportunity to go out there and, and learn how to do that uh, uh, that thing again. Um, gameplay is long and enduring and keeps the player's interest. So it's not going to end in two minutes. You know, as an example, you're going to continue to challenge the player for. Um, a while, okay? And again, depending on the type of game, this may not apply to mobile games, right? Long and enduring, I mean, yes, it'd be nice if they want to, but remember we talked about last time where you want the player to be easy to start the game and easy to stop the game. So in this case, we might, as a mobile mobile game designers, violate this heuristic because it doesn't make sense for our platform. Um, any fatigue or boredom was minimized by varying activities and pacing during the gameplay. So Varying activities means I'm always not going to do the same thing. I'm not fighting or uh, pressing the, you know, the, the fire button constantly. Maybe sometimes I'm avoiding things. Maybe the pacing is slower in some places or faster in another place, right? So, um, yeah, and, and I think Samuel says it uh, best, which is they're great. The heuristics are great, but they're not rules. Exactly. They're absolutely not rules. They're more like guidelines. They're saying, hey, sometimes these things can apply to you and sometimes violations are okay because, um, you know, we want to make it that way. We've we've added that in because, and we know the players are going to suffer, but this is part of the challenge of, of why that's happening. Um, uh, and, and I think, Samuel, you're absolutely a bang on because there's a lot of games, popular games, that violate a lot of these but it's something to keep in mind when you when you I'm not expecting you to do all of these things. That's impossible. 
Some heuristics are going to apply to your game. Some heuristics are going to violate because it makes sense to do so. And that's where I was going to get to. Um, and yeah, and if we'll talk about all that uh, uh, a lot a lot later, right? So, um, so yeah, so and and something else we have to talk with Alex about uh, again. If it's not, I'm not, it's not fully in my control. Um, so challenge strategy uh, and pace. This is kind of something else, right? I, I won't talk about every single one of these heuristics, but it's a it's it's a guideline to look at. Okay, again, reading it all from me for from me to you is uh, it's really. You know, it's crazy for me to go through one of them, but I wanted to go through the first ones to give you a sense of how this works. So, uh, so again, the heuristic is challenge, strategy, and pace, and B1 would be challenge, strategy, and pace are in balance. Okay, that's not always the case, you know, as an example with uh, with player. Easy to learn and harder to master. I think this is a great one, but may, again, not apply to all games. But a lot of these heuristics that they've, they've you know, put into place, if you satisfy most of them, right, or a large number of them, depending on the game that you're making, they're just almost like uh, best practices more than anything else. I like to look at some of these as, you know, good things to have in your game. And sometimes when you violate the, the heuristic, that means that there's a reason. There's got to be a reason, contextual. There's got to be a narrative, uh, you know, a narrative design reason or a story choice that you've made in your game why that heuristic is being violated, whatever that is. Right. And that's what I recommend. It's a guideline, but it's also best practices in many ways. So that's kind of, uh, you know, part one. Part one is all around gameplay. Part two, um, it talks about coolness, entertainment, humor, emotional immersion. Um, and there's some good ones in there. Um, you know, as an example, um, the game uses humor well. Well, that may not apply to you. Right. So, you know, there might be some games that are horror games. There's no humor in that at all. Right. Sometimes, though, it's the other way around. You might see some horror games and there might be a narrator or something like that that's in the game itself or an NPC that's talking to you that's really funny. And it's kind of like this black humor that they're, uh, you know, that they're using in a game um, when you're in a kind of a dark, deep area of, of the dungeon or the, or the, the level. And, um, and it can be a contrast to the gruesome things that you're seeing. So... Again, it really depends on how you use this. Sometimes we violate it because the heuristic doesn't make sense. It doesn't apply to our type of game uh, where humor is uh, involved. Uh, again, category three would be usability in game mechanics. Uh, so for things like this might apply more for our interface, right? Um, some kind of documentation or tutorial. The player does not need to read the manual or documentation to play. Well, I agree with that. I think if you can get off and if you can have your uh, your controls, the default set of controls are mapped to a very common scheme, then you should be able to get off and start playing. And if you really don't want to do the tutorial, you don't have to. You should be able to skip the tutorial and do whatever you want to do, right? Status and score. Game controls are consistent with the game and follow standard conventions, which is what we just talked about. Um, Score indicators uh, are seamless, obvious, and available and do not interfere with gameplay. So again, the idea that the interface doesn't interfere or doesn't become an obstacle for your for your game is a good thing. Again, I'm not going to read all these. These are for some of you to uh, to explore. But they're good thoughts. They're good things to look at because it may it might make perfect sense, uh, you know, to give you ideas of, of uh, how this might work. Um, let's look at screen layout. All right, so we were talking about interfaces today. So this might be a good heuristic to look at. Screen layout is efficient, integrated, and visually pleasing. We talked about that in our in our little talk. The player experience of the user interface is consistent, right? The player experience, uh, the user interface or heads up to play as part of the game. So it's diegetic. Art is recognizable to the player and speaks to its function. All right, so again, really good um, way of explaining interfaces in a very succinct way. Right. So so that's pretty good. Heuristic um, uh, game story immersion. Right. As an example, and we keep going down into there and there's more uh, than this. This is just an example of the play heuristic for, um, you know, for an average game. There are specific heuristics that have been created for um, things like a, a VR game, you know, um, like where you know, the VR game doesn't make you sick. That might be a, you know, a best practice, you know, uh, VR controls are remappable, you know, that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of, uh, of things you can think about. And one thing I would challenge you to do is make your own heuristic chart. So going back to what, uh, um, 
our friend uh, Samuel said, make your own best practices, right? Start thinking about things that, that speak to you uh, when it comes to what you think are important elements of every game, things that players shouldn't violate. And write those things down because maybe that's going to be the style of game you want to make, right? And there might be some things in here that you might think about and say, nah, I don't think that's important for my type of game, right? Or, yeah, it's going to violate it or this doesn't apply, you know, one of those kind of things. But again, I think play heuristics or any kind of heuristics in general, um, you know, rules of play or, or rules of making a game, they're not really rules, they're guidelines and best practices. Okay, any questions around play heuristics and what those are? Again, lifted from a games user research course uh, I did. I think it's a great little uh, tool that you can use to ask yourself the questions when you're designing your game. It could influence the way that you think about designing your game world, your interface, um, and interactions in the game as well. Or it might you might decide that you don't really like it. Okay, any questions around this? So this is kind of the first part of our of our session. We kind of worked through about um, just over an hour and a half, almost an hour and a half of our time, an hour and 20 minutes or so. And um, we're going to take a short break now and get our, our eyes away from the screen. Um, before we do that, I just want to go and, uh, you know, go back to a little bit of admin administration. Again, Lab 2 has been released. It's making an interface. We're going to do that together. Um, and remember, keep in mind for those people who are watching this uh, remote that, um, you know, again, we're going to assignment one part one is due next week on, um, you know, at the end of the week at midnight. So please make sure that you, if you haven't had a chance to start your, uh, you know, building up your assets, uh, you know, to put together a, a level, please do that, um, you know, as soon as possible, uh, because at the end of the day, what ends up happening is, you know, it kind of sneaks up on you and trying to pull together assets really quickly the night before to submit and create your game design document. Um, you may not get the best results. <laughs> All right. Any questions before we, we kind of take a break for about uh, 10 minutes before we come back and do the tech piece? Folks, the quiz is going to be all this, this theory that we've talked about, Harrison, from weeks one to three. It's just an it's just an, an opportunity for you guys to look through the the uh, the stuff I've shared with you on PowerPoint, as well as things we've talked about in the lectures. Okay. And again, open book, open internet, all that kind of stuff. It's not going to be something that should be difficult. Just another opportunity for it to go through your head. All right, that's it. Let's take a short break. I'm just going to stop uh, streaming here on YouTube. And uh, 